not sure yet what they're going to do. We'll tell them we'll keep them informed as soon as we know. Okay, we'll just that that they don't know what they're going to do, and they will keep you advised when they get All right, Drew. All right, come on. Go ahead. Okay, I've got the main bus card. 11 point, main bus card number one. And Gemini 7 goes merrily on its way. That was a recorded uh, tape of conversation as Gemini 7 got its uh, first uh, updating of uh, missions and times since the failure of Gemini 6 to get off at 9.54. 9.54 was the scheduled time. We had ignition, uh, but then an automatic shutdown one and a half seconds later. And uh, now Shira and Stafford still wait in their spacecraft for the erector to be raised so that they can come back to Earth. For the second time, disappointed in their flight. That erector is scheduled now to go up in about 15 minutes. Gemini 7, as we said, uh, meanwhile continues to whirl around and will be up four days more until uh, the now scheduled rendezvous on Thursday. They have already established several firsts in space. In another uh, two and a half hours, they will have been up longer than any men have before. That was uh, Gordon Cooper and Pete Conrad in August, 190 hours. They will pass that at about 1.30 this afternoon. Meanwhile, they've already, for the first time, uh, kept station with their booster, it's called. That is, after they were launched last Saturday, they turned around and maneuvered uh, their Gemini 7 spacecraft so they could keep the booster uh, just a few hundred feet away for almost one complete orbit. For the first time, they have flown in an underwear environment. Uh, Jim Lovell uh, went in, got in uh, out of his uh, spacesuit uh, on uh, Sunday, the day after the uh, launch, and stayed out of it until yesterday when uh, he put the suit back on so Command Pilot Frank Borman could take off his suit and uh, fly around in his underwear, find it much more comfortable. Both of them said it's, uh, it's the way to fly. Uh, they do not want uh, the uh, mission control, both of the men, to get into uh, the underwear at the same time. They want one man always capable of immediately reinflating or inflating his suit if there should be any failure of the spacecraft. Uh, one of them will be able to work to bring it back. They also have, for the first time, navigated by the stars in a major orbital change, uh, getting Arcturus, the star Arcturus, uh, perfectly in line and uh, maneuvering uh, toward it, in a sense, in order to make uh, the orbital change. And they got congratulations from the ground for that first celestial navigation feat. Also, I suppose it should be recorded to the first sneeze in space has been accredited to Gemini 7. Uh, Frank Borman uh, sneezed a couple of times on Wednesday night, gave a little concern to the tracking station that heard him, but uh, Dr. Barry said it uh, wasn't of any great import. The only problem they really had up there is, is breathing this pure 100 degree, 100% 100 oxygen. Uh, their nasal and throat passages have dried out, which was somewhat expected. They're using ointment, but they're not taking any medication for that as yet. CBS News coverage of Gemini 6 and 7 will continue in a moment. This is Walter Cronkite back at our CBS News Space Center, where we have reported this morning the dramatic moment of pad 19. As uh, at the precise second of uh, ignition, the engines of Gemini 6 fired up but were shut down one and a half seconds later because of what apparently was a loose tail plug. Uh, that uh, would not take very much fixing, but the Gemini 6 itself will have to be uh, refueled. Uh, the Titan booster for it will. And that will take uh, all of that turnaround until probably Thursday morning. Also checking out to be sure that it was the tail plug that caused the difficulty this morning. Meanwhile, the potential danger of an explosion on that pad uh, was met by Shira and Stafford with uh, the uh, calm of a, uh, of a uh, couple of uh, boys going to Sunday school on this morning. Speaking of Sunday school, uh, one of our colleagues reminds us that 
Only three major launches have been scheduled on Sunday since our space program began, and all three of them have been failures. A Venus shot and a Mariner shot were scheduled on Sunday and uh, failed, and uh, now our Gemini 6 scheduled on a Sunday failed to uh, get up. The, uh, uh, meanwhile, we're waiting uh, for that erector to, be, to go up and to get uh, Shara and Stafford safely back to Earth. Until that time comes, we don't intend to uh, leave the air. We want to see them get back uh, safely. Uh, those uh, two pilots, <coughs> Shara, a 42-year-old uh, Navy captain, and, uh, and Stafford, a 35-year-old uh, Air Force major, uh, did an excellent job this morning. But as we've told you, even while they were having their difficulties up there, they were concerned about the disappointment on the ground and told the ground crews they did the best they could and that while they were disappointed, they were ready to go again. We've been talking this morning about the window uh, that uh, opens for these flights for rendezvous, the window of 47 minutes. That's based on a, uh, uh, the fact that, of course, every few seconds that flight is delayed and takeoff, uh, that uh, target vehicle is getting a little further around the world. It comes back, of course, in a short order, but not quite on the path it was before. So every time you miss an orbit, uh, you've got to do some readjusting to, to catch it in the next orbit. And after uh, three orbits, uh, the spacecraft that you're going after is so far away, it's uh, missing some of the tracking stations. So what they plan is they would like to get up within 300 seconds, but every 100 seconds, uh, the delay means one orbit delay in making the rendezvous. And after 300 seconds, that track is so wide apart uh, that uh, they prefer to wait 24 hours. They would put the spacecraft up, Gemini 6, but it would go around 24 hours before attempting the rendezvous. There's a 35-minute pad in there to do that kind of uh, recalculating, and then an extra 12 minutes to add up to the 47, in which they would, by a, a considerable change in the direction of powered flight, while the spacecraft and the Titan booster are all together, uh, make corrections in the orbit to make uh, rendezvous. That's why a 47-minute window. The uh, men who fly this complicated and fascinating mission uh, uh, would be the same two astronauts who, of course, were disappointed on October 25th when their flight was scrubbed because of the explosion of the Agena target vehicle. Captain Wally Shira, the Navy, the command pilot, has been up there in space before. He flew six orbits three years ago in his Mercury Sigma 7, but his pilot, Air Force Major Thomas Stafford, is a newcomer to space. And nobody seemed to be interested, so... Uh... There were a lot of people out there all watching us, you know, make a landing and take off again, fly around, come back. And so I decided, well, and I, they're afraid, uh, so I asked her to walk the wings, see? She didn't ask me. You just said, climb over and get out there and hang on. Mm. <laughs> Wasn't this a little dangerous, Mrs. Shira? I didn't think anything about it. Uh, I had been flying with Mr. Shira quite a bit. And I'd helped him, different things went wrong with the plane, and we'd work on it together, getting it running again, and so I, I knew it pretty well, and I knew just where to step, and I just climbed over the side and stayed right there in the middle on the, the certain part there, I didn't step on the linen part, strut, and uh, yeah. I just held on to the struts, the beam. Mm -hmm. and that, then I climbed back in. And, of course, everybody thought, well, if she'll get out and do that, it's safe enough to take a ride. <laughs> so then we were just rushed with customers. Some people might wonder if a, a, a mother of an astronaut might be worried or concerned, but I guess any mother who got out on the wing of an airplane and didn't act like that. Uh... Oh, don't worry. A mother's different. <laughs> oh, it is different. Yes. I wasn't a mother then. And uh, a mother's always concerned about her children. The picture the Shiraz painted was of an easy, relaxed time around that house in New Jersey. He's smart. He was then. And while I used to help him once in a while with his algebra and so on, those things, I, uh, he didn't need too much help. He was a good boy, anyway. He loves, just loves music. And the moment he comes in this house now, why, the music, his dear, nice stereo, he has stereo in every room, and there's always music in the house. And he loves art. 
He loves literature, uh, which I think is unusual for someone with a technical background. But he, he satisfied me fine. He, I enjoyed him as a son. He was mischievous, but I enjoyed that too. Well, uh, could you, how mischievous was he, Mrs. Sherrard? Very. <laughs> <laughs> Wally, who was already a veteran of space travel, named his Mercury capsule Sigma-7 to honor the engineers of space flight. He had planned to become an aeronautical engineer, but instead he became a Navy flyer who downed a MiG in Korea. Bill Stout asked whether he wouldn't prefer to be fighting today in Vietnam. It's a, a different kind of challenge, but it's one I wanted and accepted in the past. I feel that... Uh, the action that's going on in Vietnam, of course, is what I was trained so completely for when I, in turn, was in combat in Korea. At this point in time, I'm much better trained to do the job I'm doing. Wally is married to the former Joe Fraser of Seattle. They have a son, Wally III, and a daughter, Susie. Even though you've been there before, uh, how do the members of the Shira family feel about the coming flight? I'm sure that there's always a degree of apprehension. I hope there's not fear. I hope to dispel fear by dispelling ignorance. And if I can explain what we're doing on this mission satisfactorily to you and our audience, then possibly you know that's what I've been trying to do for my family, to make them aware of what I am doing. <laughs>